Let's talk about four children who bask in a level of privacy they don't deserve, and one child who desperately needs a level of privacy she'll never get. We'll begin with the four bad boys. Venue Net cub reporter Ian Thompson filed a story with the headline, Teen Virus Writer Dodges Prison. One 16-year-old earned a suspended sentence in a British court for distributing the Randex worm, a combined operation between New Scotland Yard, the FBI, and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police led to his arrest, along with two Americans and a Canadian, Thompson noted. Nowhere in the story did Thompson identify any of these four boys. In fact, Thompson didn't even bother to explain why he protected their identities. A recent Google search reveals no names for those accused of distributing the Randex worm. None. Courtrooms and reporters alike do everything they can to shield a teenage hacker's identity. I said it before, and I'll say it again. Only in the computer security world can you keep your name out of the newspapers even after you plead guilty to a heinous crime. No paparazzi will stalk a teenage hacker for a photograph. You won't see his name splashed on the pages of Time or Newsweek or The Inquirer. You most certainly won't learn his identity from VenueNet or The Register. The suspect, who has a credit card and a checkbook and a part-time job and a small entrepreneurial business on the side and drives a car and watches R-rated movies by himself, cannot be identified under the Youth Criminal Justice Act. The child stands accused of wiping out two-thirds of the world's computing power, dot, dot, dot. As bizarre as it sounds, if a teenage hacker's parents commit a crime, their names will likewise stay out of the newspapers, too. Why? Because it would reveal vital details about the identity of the teenage hacker. <gasps> We saw a prime example of this in 2000 when one hacker's father was arrested. The unidentified teen stood accused of a $1.7 billion crime, while the unidentified father stood accused of conspiracy to commit assault. Now, I dared to name both the boy and his dad in a column appropriately titled, This Column is Banned in Canada, page 2. Okay, now let's talk about a newborn baby named Thomas C. Green filed a story in the register on how detectives used the internet to track down her mother's killer. Why did Green identify the newborn by name in his story? Well, uh, you see, the killer carved out of her mother's womb and she somehow survived the impromptu cesarean. And, well, you know, obviously then... That's why the press needs to identify her by name. Desperately needs her privacy. She'll never get it, though, because she's the victim of a crime, not the perpetrator. You know the paparazzi will do everything they can to snap photos of this newborn child. Her name will splash the pages of Time and Newsweek and, of course, The Inquirer. Media Inc. will forever tattoo this poor little girl. We can only hope she someday overcomes her privacy stigma like Kim Fook did. She was the naked little Vietnamese girl burned by napalm in that Pulitzer-winning photograph, if you don't remember her. Ironically, if had gone over to the dark side and destroyed computers, she'd get all the privacy she so rightfully deserves. A privacy four boys clearly don't deserve. Enjoy the media's double standard, folks. As for me, I need to take a shower. Or <clears throat> at least wash my hands. Know what I mean? I'm Rob Rosenberger for V-Myths. That's V M Y T H S dot com truth about computer security hysteria be there or be scared <laughs>